What's going on, everybody? That time again, it's the Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 61 on this Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Josh Calloway, Colin Kennedy with you on a Thursday loaded recruiting notes and nuggets show. Colin was in Atlanta over the weekend. We're going to break it all down, his trip all the way out there in the southeast in Georgia. We also have some staffing stuff we want to get into. Touch on a little bit on the Tuesday show, the movement there. We'll get into that a little bit further on today's program. And we'll close out with a little college football playoff talk. Why not? The expansion is maybe going to happen. They solidified the format with the automatic qualifiers. It's kind of a mess. We'll break it down if, if uh, this new system is going to work. Do we like it? Do we hate it? We'll get into it a little bit. Why not here on a Thursday? But CK, let's we'll start with the weekend in Georgia. Uh, you mm-hmm. talked about that last week on the show, <clears throat> last Thursday, that you were going to be hitting the road, driving out there to the Atlanta area um, for recruiting camps and events. Lots to digest and take from it, I'm sure. So we'll break it down a bit here on the Thursday show. Just to open, just some general thoughts and takeaways, I guess, from you before we get into any specific names or anything like that on the OU end of things. Just what was the uh, the thoughts coming out of it for you as you uh, spent you know a couple days down there in uh, Atlanta? Yeah, first of all, it's not a short drive from Dallas no. yeah. to Atlanta. That was one of my primary <laughs> takeaways. But chief among all of it, two things that I think really stood out that I feel Oklahoma fans would like to sort of expand upon. Number one being, I think that the South Central region, I've always kind of said this, the South Central, especially the state of Texas, right, I'm a Texas high school football guy. I'm a sure. product of it. Everyone knows this recruiting hotbed is one of the best, if not the best, in all of high school football. I've always said the best player can be found in Texas, but the best athletes can be found in the Southeast. Mm-hmm. And man, I'll tell you, pulling up to Under Armour Atlanta. And seeing guys check in, the first groups that checked in, if I remember correctly, were the offensive and defensive linemen. And I'm looking at some of these guys, and it's like, man, there are truly, yeah. truly there are creatures down here, man. And I, again, I think that the level of not just coaching, but like the dedication to football down here in our neck of the woods advances players further and further along than a lot of other places across the country because the bottom line is, in in Texas especially, and Oklahoma is in there as well, there's not only gigantic high school football programs that have extensive staffs. There are seven-on-seven tournaments every weekend. There are a million wide receiver defensive back trainers and coaches. You can find an offensive or defensive line trainer to work with on your downtime, these guys are always around the game and working on their craft. And we talk about this a lot. It's a, it's very different. The level of not dedication, but like overall exposure that kids get to the sport relative to their location. And I think when I went out there and this camp was a blend of Georgia guys, Mississippi guys and Alabama guys, Mm. You could just tell, like, yeah, they may not be foot working it up like a, a wide receiver in Texas who's trained had a wide receiver coach for nine years and has been sure. playing at a place like Duncanville. But man, like just the athletic builds, the body types, and, and it really stood out to me, Josh, along the lines of scrimmage. They just don't make them that way down here. They don't. That leads me into my second point. It's for all these reasons, if you're Oklahoma, that you go and try to recruit these guys. It's Mm -hmm. not, it's not something that I think the casual consumer of college football sees, and maybe they read an article from us at Sooners Illustrated and are like, oh, the Sooners Illustrated staff is saying, oh, he's gonna try and recruit Georgia more. That makes sense that they're going to the SEC. Well, no, like obviously location has a lot to do with it. But if you're going to compete in this league, we talk so much about the lines of scrimmage, right? And I have not seen an assortment of 6'4", 6'5", hovering around 300 pounds body types 
all assembled in one place like that in a very long time. And they were all at this one camp. There's a reason why the Georgias and the Alabamas win so frequently, and it's because they've been recruiting these types of guys for decades. Right. right? Oklahoma, yeah, Oklahoma, Texas, these programs that are moving into the SEC, they've recruited the the big bodies. Like, let's not act like there's not extreme talent in the state of Texas or what have you along the offensive and defensive lines. But I'm just here to tell you, as someone who's been in this profession and scouting prospects and evaluating players, what I saw in Atlanta over the weekend was different. And that is what you're going to see if you're Oklahoma on the field every single Saturday, whether you like it or not. And that's why you go prioritize these players. That's why you go recruit these kids who are in the Southeast residing around Mm -hmm. the league that you're going to play in because they are premium position players with a level of athletic ability and overall frame that I don't think Oklahoma or Texas have really grasped how different they are. And that's why I think it's imperative that not only I go out there to see this new sort of recruiting territory for OU, but that Oklahoma continues to fully prioritize it because inevitably it might actually help you win games, especially along the lines of scrimmage. So piggybacking right off that, what about some guys that stood out? Um, You know, obviously there's, I'm sure a lot, but guys that OU fans should be aware of that you saw this weekend that, when you left, you were still thinking about like, yeah, that those few names are ones that that you know pop in your brain as kind of standing maybe a cut above in, in terms of you know ties to OU and that fans should be aware of. Yeah, one guy who kind of caught me off guard. I saw him make a statement on social media that he's still in been in contact with Oklahoma is Micah Debose. Micah Debose is already six foot five, three hundred and ten mm-hmm. pounds, and freakishly athletic as an offensive lineman out there in Alabama. I, I don't think Oklahoma is obviously towards the top of that recruitment. That would be preposterous to say, but he did mention that he's at least still hearing from OU. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy, Josh, that furthers my point, right? Like he is just a different caliber of player than we're used to seeing in the South Central. Really freakishly athletic, big, long offensive line type and, and really impressive player. But guys that I think Oklahoma are a little bit more further along with that I went out to see, a little bit lower on the totem pole as far as they'll use advancement in the recruitment because it's early. Travis Smith Jr., the wide receiver out there in the area, I believe he's a Westlake product out there in Georgia. Yeah. Really talented wide receiver. I I, I fought for him to get into the top performers article. I thought – at six foot four and around 180 something pounds, he was smooth, cool, calm, collected. Just kind of the word I started throwing around for him is savvy. He was a savvy yeah. wide receiver at his size of six four, elite route runner, embraces contact. One thing that Hudson Standish, one of our national scouting analysts, and I were talking about, especially when we were formulating the top performers article together, I encourage Oklahoma fans to go read the Under Armour Atlanta top performers piece that we published at 24-7 Sports. Travis Smith's ability to separate, and especially separate late, he kind of has this awareness about him to even when the defensive back has solid positioning, and that's not very often, folks. Even when the defensive back is in solid position, maybe in the hip pocket, Travis Smith would bait the defensive back into thinking the ball wasn't coming with his eyes, his head, staying close to the defensive back, and then at the last second, separate and use one hand and catch the ball. All completely balanced. Like His body control was insane. Really talented player, and I'm going to talk about him in the next topic of discussion as it relates to this camp. Another guy I wanted to mention, uh, Jaden Harmon is a linebacker that I love on film. Like He's probably one of my favorite prospects 
to watch on tape. I'm I've been calling him a heat seeking missile. Hmm. He 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 has the speed and quickness of a defensive back, but he wants to take your head off like a linebacker. And he has played some safety. He has played some backer. He has played some nickel. And I I think that not only his kind of unique skill set, but his awareness and athletic ability on the field, how it all kind of combines, makes him a really talented player. He looked really solid during the camp. Isaiah Gibson is an edge rusher in Georgia at Warner Robins, who I had an awesome conversation with his mother while he was being interviewed by some Georgia reporters, and she could not believe that Isaiah was the type of talent that would draw someone to drive the 12 hours from Oklahoma, Texas area yeah. to Georgia. She was dumbfounded, but like, there's a reason why I wanted to go see Isaiah Gibson. He came in, and I'm sitting there with national scouting analyst Cooper Patagna and our director of scouting at 24-7 Sports, Andrew Ivins. And, and both of those guys are as elite evaluators as I've ever been around. Sure. We're sitting there watching the defensive line come in, and I'm looking around, and Andrew Ivins goes, like, just out of nowhere, like, who is that? And <laughs> That's the best. Yeah, that's the best. It's Isaiah Gibson, man. He he looked really good. Now, the one-on-one -on -one portion, he didn't take a ton of reps. He kind of – I think it was kind of a different environment. And, again, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about. Maybe these guys aren't as used to camp one-on-ones as maybe a – player in Texas would be because there's so many camps and trainers and all that down here. Mm -hmm. But Isaiah Gibson's like build and frame and all of that spectacular. And you can see why Oklahoma wants him. Again, we'll, we'll get into more of that here in a second. Last thing I would say, kind of a fun little nugget. And there's so much else I could dive into, right? Like there's a lot of guys I wanted to see who have OU offers that weren't there. One offer I would send out tomorrow if I were in Oklahoma's recruiting department would be to Caden Hall, who, believe it or not, is a Florida guy that came out to the Atlanta camp because I believe he couldn't make one of the Florida-based camps or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Long story short, folks, the wide receivers and the skill guys, they're all wearing white T-shirts. And the defensive guys were all wearing black T-shirts, if I remember correctly. And I'm sitting there, and I, I was watching one portion of the one-on-ones. And this, this guy with a white T-shirt steps into the defensive back group on the sideline. And I'm like, what is he doing? What Does this kid not know what's going on here? And the moment I finished my thought, he stepped out onto the field against a legit, like, 6'6", 258-pound tight end and locked him up. And I was like, yeah. oh, <laughs> so my fault, big All right, then. That's yeah. on me. And he proceeded to kill it in one-on-ones, had an incredible rep in the gauntlet, which is that drill that a lot of fans will recognize. It's the drill where you run across the field and the quarterbacks all throw footballs at you and you turn one to the other. Sure. Him as a defensive back with a white T-shirt on had one of the best gauntlet reps I saw in the whole camp. And I was like, I can't wrap my head around this guy. Like, what is what is this? Yeah. By the way, folks, he was like a legit six foot two, six foot three with arm length and around 210 pounds. I was I was blown away. So yeah. then I look him up. He's a 2026 kid nearby the state of Georgia. I believe the town that he lives in in Florida is close to the border. He has only eight offers, but as a 2026 defensive back at legit 6'3 type of height with long arms and a 210-pound build who can cover, I watched his tape afterwards. He plays up at the single high safety at that size and down into the box, sometimes even as a linebacker, and he plays wide receiver. And I was like, I can't get enough of this guy. And that's, again, the type of freak show athlete Mm -hmm. that lives down in the southeast in an OU offer that I would make if I were in that office. Now, they know a lot more about football than me. I'm a smart guy. But also the 2026 cycle, as we know, is well down the line. Just guys that really caught my attention as it relates to Oklahoma and some of the stuff we're talking about as it relates to just the, the different level of athlete that's down there in that part of the country. 
Yeah, I love to, like you said, with 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 Andrew Ivins, the that's always the best. And the guy walks in, and you just know without even seeing him play or anything, just I'm going to need to know that guy's name. And we talked about that with me with Devon Mitchell last year at uh, Venables Camps in the summer. That's always. I said it when I, the the commitment ceremony for Danny Okoye. I'd never seen him play or anything, but when he came in the room, it was like, yeah, that yeah. guy, that that's our guy right there. Um, that's always the one of the best is when you just – they just look different. You just know uh, whether you're a talent evaluator or not. You just – when you see them, you just kind of know sometimes. And so uh, cool to see uh, all those guys standing out and um, uh, some names obviously to, to file away for all you fans to keep in mind. So to kind of pivot off that, the recruiting aspect of it in terms of some more notes, nuggets, how are you kind of feeling about some of those guys that you mentioned and just anything else you took away um, on the recruiting end of things from the, the weekend there? Yeah, I don't think I was alone in kind of being a little bit surprised that Micah DeBose mentioned Oklahoma. I'm here to kind of stifle that. I don't, I don't get overly excited or like don't think this is sure. something you have to worry about if you're an Oklahoma fan. I really don't know if OU is going to be able to garner the traction that is needed uh, within that recruitment, but that is a fascinating one, I will say. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say Oklahoma could at least throw its hat in the ring, but that's a guy who had decommitted from Georgia, was not upset, but a little bit disappointed that Scott Huff, who came over from Washington to Alabama, left the Crimson Tide for sure. a job at the Seattle Seahawks, sure. one of the best offensive line coaches in college football. So I don't know. I, maybe things pick up there, but it's just I didn't really see that as something I was overly concerned about coming out of the camp. Travis Smith Jr., believe it or not, dropped the top eight, and this is why I wanted to talk about him. He dropped the top eight this month, and he got his Oklahoma offer last month. So it's been literally less than about 30 days, I believe, since he got his OU offer, and he put OU in the top eight. And I was like, hey, look. like There you go. Yeah. Why? What, what, what's the deal here? Like, do I even need to be, like, worried about this just between us? And he was like, no, nah, man. Like, he been, he's, he had some really cool stuff to say. He was like, I loved watching Marquise Brown. I loved watching D.D. Westbrook. I loved watching C.D. Lamb. And those are guys that I actually watched tape of to model my technique and game after. And that's good. To, yeah. Oh, you fans are like that. Yeah. Yeah. And – it's, it's not the worst wide receiver core to mention when we're talking about a player who's inside the top 247. Yeah, man, I, I really like Travis Smith Jr. And for him to kind of have that familiarity of OU wide receiver play, like the bottom line here too is, and I'll talk about this in a second, a lot of these guys down there in the Southeast, as much as OU fans might even get offended by this, they don't watch OU football. Like, they don't. And now a lot of them are learning about it. And so for someone like a Travis Smith Jr. to not only be aware of it, but have kind of that yeah. secondary level of knowledge as it relates to his position, I think that's pretty important. But yeah, I put it on our board. I, I think this is a guy that might actually look to take an official visit with Oklahoma in the summer. Now, there's one more wide receiver spot. I know everyone who wants to be the recruiting experts like, well, they can only take one more, Colin. So why should why are we even talking about it? Well, if a guy wants to visit, like, you let him take the visit. And I just think he's a really talented player. So, sure, yeah, Travis Smith Jr. kind of feels like someone I'm going to have to be aware of a little bit more and more, even though, as we know, the race to the final receiver spot is going to be pretty highly contested. But the beauty of this that no one talks about is that all these prospects can show their interest. On the end of the day, it's Oklahoma – who has to make the take. So I think OU is going to be patient in evaluating some of these other players because there were a couple of the guys, I believe it's CJ Wiley is another six foot four wide receiver in Georgia. He was not at the camp, um, but I wanted to see him. And then there's another one. And I want to say his name might be Dion Thomas, who was another six foot four wide receiver. Funny how I just keep rattling off six foot four wide receiver. Yeah. They make a bit out there. Yeah. And down in the Southeast. But, yeah, those were some of the guys that I really wanted to see that they they weren't there, but Travis Smith was, and their recent offers, I believe, by Oklahoma at that position group. So something to note. Jaden Harmon and I had a really good discussion. He was one that was like, yeah, honestly, I don't really know a ton about Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. But I, I he said, I did think it was really cool 
that I was the first ever offer by Zach Alley. Definitely something to consider, right? He called it special. Yeah. And on top of that, Brent Venables flew out to see Jaden after the offer came in at his high school. And Jaden was like, look, I mean, that's the best linebacker coach in college football. That's what I do know. Brent Venables is one of, if not the best at developing my position group. And I, and I asked Jaden, I was like, okay, you know, I know there are some heavy hitters in this area, Clemson, Auburn, things of that nature. But and he didn't put this specifically on the record, but I did think it was part of his very intriguing answer. Kind of unprompted. The context here is that Jaden Harmon has almost every offer of the country right now, thirty up to 33 offers as of yesterday. Ohio State offered. And I might be wrong here, but if I remember correctly, he may not have a Georgia offer as it, is, as it stands today. And I kind of asked him about like getting to know some stuff about Oklahoma or Texas, because Texas is another one that's involved with Jaden Harmon. Yeah. He unprompted was like, look, I get there's this sense that people don't want to recruit players in the state of Georgia because they think we're all just going to go to Georgia. But he, again, this was all unprompted. He was like, I'm not like that. He was like, I want to go anywhere I can in the country that I can be developed to the best of my ability. Clemson has a crystal ball pick in. Why do I mention that? It's not me saying this one's over. It's me saying Clemson definitely has really good standing right now. But the Ohio States of the world, they're probably offering for a reason. And I think the Oklahoma offer that very recently came in, if you're Oklahoma and you see Clemson potentially in the lead, you sit there and you, you say to yourself, okay, if we get this guy on campus in an official visit capacity, which I think that they will. He mentioned OU is probably one of the four to five schools that he wants to take an official visit with. We know the numerous connections from this Oklahoma staff to Clemson. Sure. That's probably one program that can pretty effectively replicate what Harmon might experience at Clemson and what might be giving the Tigers a lead. Now, again, I'm not sitting here saying OU is going to suddenly jump up towards the top. That's just kind of an intriguing storyline for me to follow as it relates to one of the top linebacker talents in America. So I'm excited to see what happens with Jaden Harmon. Um, Isaiah Gibson was awesome to talk to. We had a really good conversation and why I really want to talk about him. People forget he was on the other junior day visit list for Oklahoma just before the dead period hit. And his arrival on campus was pretty big. And so, look, this guy's already 6'5", 240 pounds, 245 pounds, something to that effect. Georgia is in on him heavy. But Oklahoma, one thing that really stood out was he said, Miguel Chavis is my guy. We had a very distinct conversation on my visit. I love my trip to Oklahoma, but I'm a big Miguel Chavis fan. And he basically was just like, OU is the school that is talking to me. One of the most, if not the most in my recruitment. Mm -hmm. And that's important to note, note, folks, because I've heard like Georgia's outside linebackers and defensive ends coach, Chidera Uzo Deribe, who was at SMU down the street from me, is I think he's one of the best coaches at his position group in all of college football. That guy is down the road from Isaiah Gibson in Georgia and basically routinely visits that school when allowed. For Oklahoma to be right up there with a Georgia position coach through Miguel Chavis's efforts, I, that, that to me is noteworthy. So, again, OU is going to have a lot of work to do. It was kind of funny, Josh. Like, I'm talking to him. He's like, yeah, OU might be the school that talks to me the most in my recruitment. Yeah. And he's rocking a Georgia jacket and a Georgia backpack. And I'm like, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, man, I thought that was really interesting because Oklahoma, we talk so much about the defensive line recruiting. Isaiah Gibson appears to be part of this plan, not just the plan as it relates to building up the lines of scrimmage, but recruiting the state of Georgia more and more. And then another guy I really want to mention on the back end of this, 
One guy with an OU offer that I did get to see, wide receiver tight end guy, Caden Prothrow. I wrote an article about him when he got his OU offer, and he was one of these kids, again, that was like, I really just don't know anything about OU, but I'm excited to learn. He said he was excited to get to know Emmett Jones. He's six foot six, and I believe he's close to 230 pounds. Runs routes as a receiver, but I look at him and say, like, that jumbo wide out to tight end frame, maybe he's like a, and I'm not directly comparing, maybe he's kind of like a Mark Andrews skill set where it's like, this guy's gigantic. He may not be an elite inline blocker anytime in his career, but we can find a variety of ways to utilize him and get him the football. I had a really good I had a really good talk with Caden Prothrow and OU offer at kind of that flex tight end receiver spot. And he seems to be interested as well. But he is a 2026. The other guys i I just mentioned are all 2025. So yeah. essentially one outlier. But yeah, man, really fun camp. I just wanted to get out there, not just for a change of scenery, because the seven on seven circuit circuit down here in Texas is wearing on me a little bit. But <laughs> it was cool to kind of get almost like a change of scenery and a fresh perspective on the direction of this program as it relates to the players that they recruit. And it seems like that recruiting effort's going pretty well. Low to talent. And, uh, you know, I mean, providing for further context here, obviously if you were listening, you know, Colin obviously thinks highly of these guys and, and what they can be and what they can do, but just further context for just to put hard numbers on it. I was looking these guys up as we were going along. Travis Smith, obviously, 2025, like we said, four-star receiver, 197 overall in the composite, 20, number 25 receiver in the class. Jaden Harmon, number 150 overall in the class in the composite, number 19 linebacker in the class. And then Isaiah Gibson, we have him as number 83 overall player in the class, uh, top 10 edge. So, I mean, just to give you perspective for everybody listening, kind of wondering, okay, obviously Colin thinks these kids are good, but where are they rated? What are their stars? Things like that. People, you know, nice, hard numbers to look at. There you go. They're all top 200 players. And in the case of Isaiah, gets in a top 100 player um, currently rated in that class. They all are composite four stars that could very well get to five because they're all in the 9-2, 9-3 range. So they could, they could get there. Um, pretty special uh, talent group. And so we'll keep an eye on all of them. Some names to know. You just got smarter. Any of you fan tuned in, you just got smarter. You know more than the fellow fan who's not listening to the show. There you go. So load recruiting in further from CK. Great weekend uh, in Georgia. Do want to do uh, a little bit on the staffing side of it. Um, now, we talked about on Tuesday with Tom and James on the show about, you know, the Jolie Ale hire, which, Colin, you broke um, earlier this week on Monday morning. J.R. Sandlin, later that day, Arlo Matt Zanitz broke, leaving to take the SMU assistant AD job. So we kind of reacted to it and broke it down a little bit on Tuesday. But since I had you here, just a little further context, I guess, for both things, uh, obviously, again, you broke the ale hire. So from what you've been told or hearing, what made her the right move here? Because I we talked about it at the time on our VIP message board with our subscribers. When Lee Davis left, both you had heard and I had heard separately that probably an SEC hire was the way this was going to go. And it, it didn't go that way, obviously. Her most of her experience in the Pac-12, a little bit in the NFL. Um I, I don't, you know, again, I talked around Tuesday too. It's kind of hard to know what to make of these hires or what kind of impact they're going to have. You know, it's not a position coach. You can look at a proven track record or something like that. You put this many guys in the league. But from what you, your understanding is, what does this hire mean and what should, how should OU fans feel about it? I guess, because a lot of fans have asked, just, is this like, what, what do we do with this information? Do we like this? Do we not like this? Where, where are you kind of standing with it right now? Yeah, I'll, I'll address the SEC narrative because. As I've gotten educated more and more, I think that that discussion is incredibly silly for anybody to have. And like hand up, I, when I was told, like you'd heard, oh, they might want someone who's done director of on-campus recruiting in the SEC. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, you know, that makes sense. But man, if you really boil it down, like how silly it would be to just try and check that one box and take out so many serious candidates because of it. Right. The director of on-campus recruiting folks doesn't travel. They, It's not on them to uphold regional relationships, right? They're not area recruiters. They're not the ones 
blowing up these guys' phones with, hey, man, we are we got a game this weekend. Like, right. hope you can get out on campus. Soon. None of that is this role's job description. So if you're just looking at it within the lens of, okay, we need someone from the SEC, why? What's the reason? Because the reason you go and hire someone like Jolie Ale, from what I've heard, and I talked to some folks I know in the recruiting and personnel space who I trust, she's incredibly detail-oriented. Yeah. She's personable. She's organized. She is efficient. She has different levels of experience and kind of a wide-ranging perspective. And not only has she filled the job before, and by the way, when she was with Utah in this specific role, they won the Pac-12 championship. She's also someone who has gone to the NFL and learned kind of like a, almost like a futuristic perspective. If you think about it within the lens of like how college football is trending, mm. right? And so I, I've actually had a couple of sources text me. She has gotten to Norman. I think she's getting settled in. But she's been around the building since I broke the news. And she seems to already be, like, everyone's already a big fan of hers sure. in the building. So you're hiring someone within this role to plan and organize events, monitor the recruiting budget, build up recruiting communications, things of that nature. None of these job descriptions or details really relate to anything as it obviously relates to geography. Like, no matter where you are in the country, the same job description is going to be posted for a director of on-campus recruiting. And I think in the sense of Jolie Ale, again, someone who, as a person, seems to check a ton of boxes that you would want within this director type of role. Mm. I personally think this is a a home run hire by Brent Venables, especially as it relates to replacing Lee Davis, who was very good at her job and obviously left the program to take an assistant AD gig at a place like UCF. What about the J.R. Sandlin, you know, part of it? You know, a lot of fans, I think the obvious questions here are uh, how big a deal is it to lose them, but then – was it expected? You know, I think that's a lot of our VIP board message um, members have asked, you know, what was this out of nowhere? And, you know, I kind of talked about on Tuesday a little bit. My understanding, and you can certainly disagree or, you know, give your your input from what you've been told. But my kind of understanding was semi-expected. I mean, it was never, not necessarily this week, you know, or this month, but he was never a long-term, he's going to be at OU for 10 years type right. of guy either. And they were kind of prepared for this to happen. That was my understanding. Um, what have you been kind of been told regarding the Sandlin departure? And what is your expectations for a replacement there? And how do you think Oklahoma will go about filling that void? And we talked about on Tuesday a little bit, you know, that Curtis Lofton has occupied some of that GM uh, duties, not full-blown. He's not the full-time GM. He can't be because there's some NIL legalities there. It gets a little hairy. But he's occupying that role in some regards – I guess how you kind of absorb all of it, that Sandlin left and how you think Oklahoma's going to move forward and that's just kind of all of it, where, where you kind of sit. Yeah, I I got to listen to a little bit of, of the Monday show that you guys did just while I was navigating the travel and everything. And to kind of reiterate, you know, I, I, I was the one that reported that J.R. Sandlin had a chance to very realistically be on Jeff Levy's staff at Mississippi State. Like the moment yeah. that happened. True, true. I put on our board, hey, guys, like I'm hearing he's a serious candidate to take an on-field assistant coach job, maybe even as the, the tight ends coach for Jeff Levy. Now, obviously, Levy went in a different direction, but why I bring that up, even before then, when I was reporting on J.R. Sandlin and his status within the program, like, it had always kind of been hinted to me, this is someone who's going to want to continue to advance his career. And he's obviously a very well-known name in the social media sphere, right? He's, 
I don't want to say gone viral, but he's kind of like a, a mm -hmm. largely known voice as it relates to high school players and recruiting advice. And a lot of that is what he did at Jacksonville State, if I remember correctly. And when he took the Oklahoma job, I think a lot of that was him wanting to work in the recruiting sphere for a program headed to the SEC in order to try and turn that either into an on-field role somewhere or a high-ranking off-the-field job as it relates to the future of college football. And yeah. I think that's what J.R. Sandlin accomplished here. He he was never going to be someone who stuck around at Oklahoma for a very long time. He was just a – he was just someone who was very good at his job, who was very well known, had an extensive social media presence and a large network as it relates to the high school recruiting space. He was going to be able to help Brent Venables and this staff execute efficiently and effectively as a director of recruiting and director of player personnel. He was very good at his job and he was a workaholic. And I think him working so much as who he is as a, a person really helped kind of stabilize some things for Brent Venables out of the gate. So yeah, him taking the SMU gig makes a ton of sense. I think it's something that he he needs to do as it relates to the future of his career. Yeah. And the Oklahoma side of the equation is like I don't I don't I don't want to downplay the loss, but I also don't know that it's catastrophic either because Curtis Lofton, if you figure out a way to get him more and more roles in that general manager kind of space, he's mm -hmm. going to be really good at it. I mean, we're talking about a guy that not only has experience in the NFL and knows how to navigate things like contract negotiations, stipulations, sure. roster building, and personnel management. He's also a graduate of the university who played at Oklahoma. Like, that's probably a guy, if you give him a high-ranking role within the program, he's going to be around for a long time compared to sure. J.R. Sandlin. And then, you know, there are a number of other names that I've, I've heard I don't know that it's anything worth like diving into at this time, just because I think that they are they're they're playing it patiently as it kind of relates to the future of the, for a lack of better term, front office of Oklahoma football. Because I think you have the GM stuff, director of player personnel, director of recruiting. They could expand the recruiting office if they want to. I think there's just a lot of unknowns and variables, and I think a lot of that's going to get cleared up over time. But that, as you kind of saw with the Jolie Alle, they took a month and a half. They went through visit weekends without yeah. a director yeah. of on campus. It wasn't recruiting. a quick, yeah, it wasn't a quick turnaround. And it, it wasn't a quick turnaround at a time where they were actively hosting events on campus. And then they went out and made, in my opinion, the right hire. And I think that kind of line of thinking is going to apply to this myriad of roles that we're discussing at OU. 100%. So, again, I, I feel like I pump it every show, and I pump it for good reason. Become a VIP subscriber, the Sooners Illustrated. We'll keep you updated as, as best we can on this stuff. More staffing changes likely to come. You know, it's kind of the movement shifting around uh, at this time as you kind of get ready for spring camp, which is coming up, and then the summer happens and – it's, it's go time again. Uh, more movement um, expected, possible. Um, and we'll be sure to let you know if they do solidify Lofton or they bring somebody else in to kind of just completely replace Sandlin. However they handle that, we'll be sure to let you know whenever we know uh, to our VIP members. So be sure to come with a subscriber, Sooners Illustrated, Oklahoma, 247 sportscom All right, to finish, you want to do a little uh, little CFP, a little CFP expansion? Um, it's, yeah, man. Uh, so it's hot in the streets right now. context here, I, I – I have not really learned about any of this. Now, a lot of fans at home who are listening, probably <laughs> you, you, you already know way more than me on the subject. So we're going to react to this together. You might get my live reaction to all this stuff. Sure. Apparently, Josh, we have college football expansion already happening, even though we're expanding. So, yeah, the first thing that, that happened this week, you know, they, they solidified the model for the way that the seeding is actually going to work. And this goes into effect this season, this coming year. So we're moving to the 12-team playoff. Everybody knows that. It's going to be a five plus seven model. What that means 
is five conference champions get automatic bids, the five highest ranking conference champions, and the other seven spots are going to be at large. Now, it was going to be six and six before, but they changed it because the Pac-12 no longer exists, essentially. So they changed that and made it five and seven. Now, the, the extra wrinkle there is that one through four, which get buys, you don't play in the first round, are going to be conference champions only. So that means Notre Dame cannot be in the one through four, no matter what they do. They can win a few, win every game by 100 points. They will not be one through four because they're not going to be able to win a conference because they're not in one. And the rest of that goes as you would think. You know, if Oklahoma is number two, but Alabama is number one, Oklahoma is going to go down to that number five or six spot, whatever, because you can't be have two teams from the same league in the top four. So that is silly in and of itself. A couple of days later, I'm going to report, I'm going to read it. This is from Pete Thamel at ESPN. He tweeted yesterday, sources, the idea of a 14-team college world playoff was discussed by the CFP management committee at meetings in the Dallas area today. If that happened, it would begin in 2026. So there's a lot of thought that this thing is going to go to 14 and probably 16 before it's all said and done. Colin, what do you think? Um, you know, it's it's a hot topic. A lot of fans love this. Some fans hate this. They wish we would go backwards and go back to BCS and just have the top two. I'm not really in that camp. Um, I don't like the way that the auto bids are set up. Uh, that makes no sense to me. It should just be, if you want to make automatic qualifiers, whatever. But I don't yeah. think there should be any restrictions on what seed you get when the tournament comes. What, where are you kind of stand on all of it? Do you like that we're going to 12? Do you think that uh, – just how do you feel about the, the postseason? Because it's it's completely up in the air in the sport right now and how exactly this is going to settle and what makes the most sense and what works the best. Yeah, yeah. I just – my first thought is I hope you're ready for the NFL and college football. Like It's going to be sad. Yeah. We're going to two power conferences. We're expanding to – up to 14 or 16 teams in the playoff. I just, we're heading to the NFL. So that's my first thought. The automatic bids as it relates to the seeding, I'm with you. Why on earth should that, why is that a thing? So like you're telling me that a conference champion Let's say they win nine games. A conference champion who won nine games compared to a, let's just say an SEC or Big Ten team that won 11 games. Sure. The nine and th the, the nine win team is automatically seeded above SEC or Big Ten team X that won more games. Sure. And, and might even be a better team on paper. Yeah, I can't make any sense. Well, of and that. you're also with the automatic, you're guaranteed to get a G5 team in, which again, I don't love that either. You know, if a G5 team earns it, that's cool. But in this scenario, you're always going to have one because there's only four power conferences right. now. So if you're doing the top five conference champs automatically make it, I mean, I can, anybody can put that together. That means you're going to get a G5 team in there. So like this past season, Liberty was number 23 or whatever they were. They would be in the 12 team playoff if that same thing happened this year. And that would be at the loss of whoever finished, you know, 12th, which actually last year was Oklahoma. But it's kind of hard to do the apples to apples because there was a Pac 12 last year, but there wouldn't be this year. So it gets a little hair when you try to do that direct translation one year to the next. But you get the idea. I mean, a, a team that is in the top 12 and feels like they earned it is going to lose their spot to a G5 team. That just because they won their conference, even though their conference is nowhere near like playing an SEC schedule, so it's it's a bit messy to say the least. I mean, it's a bit messy. But long story short, a team like Oregon that boat races Liberty in that bowl could be at jeopardy of losing its spot in the playoff, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, that makes zero sense to me at all, and. Oregon was the markedly better team going into that matchup. They proved it, and they now are kind of an example to me as far as, like, why this is a problem. Because mm -hmm. if you're just handing out automatic bids as it relates to just where you happen to be or, like, what conference you happen to win, then you're not only setting yourself up for a poor playoff because of the teams you put in, but 
you're you're literally jeopardizing the overall mission of what the college football playoff was instituted for. Right. The best teams make it to the playoff. And because of this process that you're laying out to me, the best teams may not make it in at all as it relates to the full field of 12, 14, or even 16. So, yeah, I, I think that's pretty preposterous. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, too, but the automatic bids, so, like, these top, since they're automatic bids and they would be in the top four to six, that's what, four to six or so, they would have home field advantage in the first round of the playoff? No, the first, the, the home field is only in the first round. The five, the five, twelve, six, eleven, seven, ten, eight, nine. Gotcha. Once you get to the quarterfinals, that's when the New Year's Six Bowls take over. Now that I don't know what that'll look like if you go to sixteen or whatever. Uh, but I, the, I, as far I, as this, how season, does it look? No huh. Where are you at on the on the number of teams? So I think that's the uh, that's the other big aspect of this. That you know, so I mean, there are there is a contingent out there that which is we just went back to the top two playing for the title. Now I, I'm not, you're, you're in that group. See, I disagree. I, I like to have the postseason bracket. I understand the devaluing the regular season, the worry for that, but I, I don't know. I mean, I have a hard time. Like the OU Texas game is not going to feel the same because there's more like, I, I have a hard time grasping that concept. You know, I do understand like it used to be when you lost one game, it was over. And there was that yeah. urgency and it was mayhem. But also, I don't know if that's necessarily a good – it's it's fun in the moment. Is it really a good thing if, like, a good team, their season's over in September? You know, it kind of stinks. I don't know. It, I could go both ways on it. So you prefer just top two BCS model if it was up to you. Yeah. Man. 100%. <laughs> There's no debate in my mind because here's, here's why I fell in love with college football, right? It wasn't just the utmost priority of winning every Saturday and the chaos that would ensue every weekend because it, you, you had to be all or nothing for every game. There was no like, ah, oh, you know, we could probably sit some guys out or whatever. Or, yeah. Like, it just feels like back then these games of like the Iron Bowl or Auburn, Georgia and things of that nature – Though you Texas games that would literally sometimes decide whether or not you are playing for a national title. Like, not only has that gone away, but I also fell in love with college football because the bowl system kind of served as as sub national championships. Like mm. the days of the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl and the Orange Bowl being like mini title games. And those becoming instant classics, like one of my favorite games I ever watched, I believe, was the Michigan State-Stanford game when Michigan State stopped Stanford on like a fourth down and one and like a walk-on linebacker jumped over the pile to tackle the running back and win the game for Michigan State. I was like, this is awesome. And they were actually celebrating like they won the national championship. And then, oh, by the way, you get through this awesome bowl slate where all these teams are fighting like it's, you know, literally their yeah. last stand. And then you get to the title game and you're like, no matter what happens, like these are the two teams that we have. And, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of debate about how you got to those two teams. But at the end of the all, like I see the intention behind the idea of just like, all right, these are the two best teams, like literally metrics, ratings, all this, all this stuff. These are how these two teams grade out. For better or worse, like, logic tells us they need to play each other. And now we're not only in a world where human interpretation decides who does and does not get to play. We're in a world where human interpretation now literally destroys the world of college football in the postseason. Sure. Sure. And that – Yeah. I've been sucks. a of the college football playoffs. I've been as critical of the playoff committee as anyone. So if you want, if you told me you want to go back to a BCS in terms of determining the seeds, I'd be okay with that because um, the cultural playoff committee has just been so horrendously inconsistent on a year to year, right. and even within the same year, you know, basis on how they decide things. Uh, we've talked about that a lot over the last decade, basically. But I, I like the postseason. I think the regular season, even the postseason expanded out. I think the regular season is still going to be great. You're still talking about a very small percentage of the teams making it relative to how many there are. I mean, you look at 
you know, sure. madness in basketball and you know all those other sports. I know the regular seasons aren't as good in those sports. I, I get that, but I still think that. I mean, you lose two or three games. I mean, you lose two, you're probably fine, but you lose three, you're really you're you're in peril now. I mean, that's not you can't just coast through a season. You know, the regular season still matters. And then maybe most important of all, once we get there, the playoff will be amazing. I don't think anybody could argue that. I mean, it, I it, hope so because it, now, it, like when you some get, group, when you get, you know, Penn State or traveling to go play Oregon, I know they're in the big, they're both in the Big Ten now, so that's a terrible example. Penn State traveling to go play Alabama or something, you know, in that eleven six, like that'll be crazy. That'll be awesome. You get matchups you never get before, so I, I like that aspect of it. Sixteen's a little big for me. Um, I'm sure I'll get used to it. it. It seems a little big. That's that's the absolute max. So you cannot go beyond sixteen. You cannot. That's the absolute max. That's the FCS number. So yeah. Do it. Um, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. I don't mind it. The The automatic situation makes no sense. It's going to be wild. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a big adjustment for all of us, though. It's going to look very different uh, than what we're used to. So your playoff guy, real quick, would you rather go down the, the path that we're heading or would you rather stay at four? So if the question is 16 or four. No, like I guess you can give me your ideal number in the playoff. Since yeah, it's tough. It's now. tough. You know, I actually, it's tough. I, I remember seeing a model a couple years back for 10 teams, which it seems like a weird number, but it actually worked pretty good. It was, I think the way it worked was, now this was in a Pac-12 world, so it might be a little tougher without the Pac-12 now, but the way it worked, it was like one through six was all your conference champs. Your high, your five conference champs, and your um, you know, your sixth team being your highest G five, and then seven through ten is is you know at large bids, and they would play each other. Seven would play ten, eight would play nine, and then from there you'd have eight teams. You just have a regular bracket. I like that system because there was very little subjectivity there. It was if you won your conference, you're in the top six, and you know the other four spots are at large. They have to play an extra round. Like the the committee involvement was so low in that system, it was very clearly defined what you needed to do. Now that was before the conferences realigned the way they have. And now mm -hmm. you have two conferences that are so clearly better than the other ones. The Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore. So that wouldn't even really work. So the number of teams, it, it is hard. I think the 12 might be okay. I, I, you know, we'll see how it looks this year. Let me, let me see it. And we'll go, I think eight probably makes the most sense really in reality is just to go to eight and you just have a nice, simple, straightforward 18 bracket. Um, I think four is a little, I don't know. Four four has been good, but it felt a little I think it'll be great once we get there. Once we get there, it's it's we're very against change. I think once we get there and we have it, I think everybody will love it. But we'll see. Maybe I'll maybe I'll have a different opinion at the end of the season. We'll see. It's gonna be wild. That that's for sure. Once we get to the playoff and it happens, it'll be wild. The matchups will be crazy. It'll be a lot of fun. But we just gotta get there first. There you have it. There we go. That's your playoff expansion. <laughs> Big picture topic of the day. It's a hot hey, we'll, topic. Yeah, I mean, it's fun to talk. It's fun to discuss. It I, I really don't know where we're going in college football at this point, but I'm still going to love the sport. You know, we're all in this together type of thing. Yeah. The so, bottom line for me is that I still feel like the, the notion that the regular season will just not be any, will not be fun or not important. I think that's not, I disagree with that point. And that's the strongest argument against expanding the playoff. And I, I disagree with that point. I still think Ohio State, Michigan is going to feel like yeah. I, I just can't buy that the Iron Bowl is not going to have the same edge to it because both teams are going to make the playoff anyway. You know what I mean? Like it just it doesn't that doesn't no. die with me. The teams still want to win the football games, people. Like that's the dumbest. Part. Like it, it's not they're not not going to be like all right, we can just take this week off because we're playing right. Illinois. Like sorry, Illinois. I think you're a good football team, but. The actual meaning is lost in obviously the bowl structure, and then there's maybe less of an edge in games that don't have the ties of a Michigan Ohio State, sure. and that's I think people get that kind of sentiment mixed up with the games mean less. But a loss, of course, means less than it did a couple of years sure. ago. Sure, so. and then you get more games at the end of the year that you know whenever. In in rivalry week in late November and number eleven's playing number fifteen right now. That's a fun game. That's essentially an extra playoff game. Now, I mean, you win that, you're probably in. You lose that, you're done. So that 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 little extra wrinkle. I, th I think it'll be great. We just got to get there. Once the season plays out, and again, maybe I'll feel different. But I think after this season, I think people will 
come around to the idea of this this is actually pretty good. So we'll see. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun to keep up with all years. It's a totally different world. We've never had anything even yeah. close to this. So it'll be fun. All that all that until Liberty gets smacked smacked again. And yeah. Qualifier. And then we're like right yeah. back to square one. It's like, all right, well that sucked. I think that's it. Long show, but we had a lot of good stuff in there. A lot of good recruiting and staff, and then we got the playoff talk. Good, good show on a Thursday. Sending you to the weekend here. It's going to be March uh, yeah. next week, which is crazy. We have the leap year, so it'll be the 29th whenever we do this thing next Thursday. So we have a couple more February shows, but we're moving into March next week. Spring camp is getting really close. A couple more weeks, and we're going to be there. Pumped up for that. Recruiting picks up, obviously, in the spring as well. Camps, seven on seven, things like that. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, all of it. It's going to be a fun uh, spring ahead. Bella Moops is going to be there in Stillwater. Keep up with coverage for that. There you go. Quick shout out before we get out of here. My guy, Coach Ant at Lakeview Centennial, repping the gear. High school coaches, if you're watching the Sooners Illustrated podcast or listening, there's a new rule going into effect. <laughs> if you pass it, I'll pot in it. So shout out Lakeview I Centennial. I will wear it on the podcast. My guy had, had me out. It was a great time yesterday at Lakeview Centennial. And Josh, they have a corner in the freshman class. Mark my words. I think he's a top 200 talent. Man. He's really good. But All right, fun show. Away. Follow that away. Yeah. Follow that away. We'll be back next week. I think thick Monday. We've had, we've had some Monday, Tuesday kind of moving around. I think Monday with Tom James, myself, recapping the weekend. Like I said, Tom and I are going to be in Stillwater for Bedlam Hoops. Huge game for Oklahoma. They, they need – they're right on. They're they're slipping a little bit. One or two more wins. They're probably in big game. Their final bedlam in Stillwater for who knows how long. So we'll be back on Monday to recap that. We'll continue our status report series and all the latest news elsewhere on OU football and basketball front. Until then, for Colin Candy, I'm Josh Calloway. We'll see you guys next time back here, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever your podcast, Monday for the next edition of the Sooners Illustrated Podcast.